Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. I normally do an intro, but it's Monica, everyone. I mean, she's like one of the first health and fitness guests I had on. And it's been like, what, probably like the fifth or sixth time that we've had her on. I'm not going to lie, everyone. We did a podcast like a month ago, but then the audio and the video was just all wacky. So if we, if it seems like we've been having this conversation before, it might just be because like subconsciously we've had it before and I just don't remember it. But yeah, she's on here to, you know, give us an update on what she's been up to. A lot of stuff has been going on. And as always, she's a very well-traveled person. So we'll be talking about her travels as well, because God, she has the travel schedule that I wish I had. And we can get into that ourselves too. But again, Monica, thank you so much for coming back on. Gosh, Ryan, for, for not giving an intro. What an amazing intro. Thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure to be on your podcast. And yeah, well, it's been, I think, probably a year or a little over a year since the last time we talked. And I can't wait to just, just get into a few things, tell you a little bit about what I've been up to. And um, anyway, whenever you want to get started. <laughs> well, as we can see from your background, you're not at the normal place that we've talked to you at. Where are you at right now? No, usually I'm at the house and you're right. About a month ago, we tried to do this. And for some reason they were, we, we've been dealing with all sorts of weird connections and everything at the house. We are at CA Acupuncture and Chiropractic Clinic, Temple of Healing, which is my husband's clinic. And so I said, okay, it's a new computer, new stuff, but hopefully the connection will be really good. And that's where we do spend, I mean, my husband spends a lot of his time. I spend a certain amount of my time because especially after working out, especially when I was competing, I needed that care. <laughs> it was, please acupuncture me, please, you know, um, adjust me, all those kinds of things that are, are really cool and really important. So here we are. You'll see some books in the background, I'm sort of in his office right now, but, but everything is quiet and nice. So we'll be able to have a good conversation. At your most competitive, how much were you getting acupuncture done and how much do you still get done even now? You know, that, that's a great point because um, when I was competing, obviously you are putting your body through the ringer um, just with the excess of the workouts that you're doing, the, you know, minimizing a lot and being very careful in what you're doing with your foods. Sometimes that can affect sleep, that can affect, I mean, so many people only go anywhere when they're hurting, when they need it as opposed to using things as a preventative. By preventing it, by coming maybe once a month, it means that if all of a sudden there's a terrible kink, if something happens, you know, working out, I don't have to come as often because the process is already there. And a lot of people don't understand what, what acupuncture really does. A lot of times acupuncture deals with a lot of the interior side of the sort of channels. And um, sometimes we have blockages energy can't flow through, our circulation is not the best. And so what those acupuncture needles do is they help correct some of that, clear some of those blockages so that you can get the oxygenation, you can get everything that you need coming the way it's supposed to be up and down in your cells. Absolutely. And God, just even hearing that, I want to go and get some acupuncture done right now. That's a, that's a it good picture. Awesome. They should hire you as a pitch lady for basically for this, for his place or something like that, because that is, yeah, that... Yeah. It is, you know, I always say chiropractic is great, acupuncture is great, but if you do them both together, it is just exponential the kind of um, results that you get. Interesting, I actually had, you know, I have four kids, and on all four children, Greg did acupuncture tour in Northern Ireland, tour in Scotland, and it was so funny because the midwives and everybody at the hospital, they were just looking, going what's he doing? What's he doing? And, and they would just talk to him. And at the end of the day, I was like, uh, excuse me, I'm the one having the baby here. <laughs> Please pay some attention to me. But it was incredible what it did just to um, ease some of the pain and make that labor that much quicker. So even that. No, hey, I mean, there's been studies proven, you know, the benefits of acupuncture and, you know, chiropractic. So I, I yeah, I have never gotten it done myself. I'm going to be completely honest, but I've always wanted to try it out. So. Oh my days. goodness. Yeah. It is a good thing, but you know, and, and that's, you were talking about the travels and things that I'd done. So one of the biggest things that I, I, I don't know if we talked after the Mr. Miss USA and we can get into mm -hmm. that a little bit later because the third one will be coming uh, into play this year in the Dallas area, which is really, really cool. But the two of us had the chance to go to Argentina 
last September, and it was the first INBA PNBA Latin American Championships that was held over there. I had the honor of being the head judge uh, because I grew up in Argentina and uh, I do know Spanish. So it was very interesting, you know, calling everything out in Spanish and, and being able to be over there. But what's interesting is we went and did some informational about that whole chiropractic, about the natural sports, about the healing that is so important. And in Latin America, these uh, the couple that is doing the Latin American championships, they've been in contact and they are working through even the Ministry of Health, getting into the kids, youth, because over there, natural bodybuilding doesn't really exist. You know, people aren't used to, oh, you can get those muscles without having to take any extra supplementation, you know. And so it is is a very new concept. It's a very different concept, but it has to start at the ground level. And that was a, a fantastic, fantastic show we had. Um, oh my gosh, we had about close to 100 athletes from all over South America, not just Argentina. And we're excited. It's going to be done again this this next September too. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I see some of those athletes from South America, and it's just yeah, I, I I've yet to see. I can understand when you said like like they don't really understand that like you can do things natural down there because yeah, there's a lot of surgeries going on down there too, especially that you can tell that you're just like, okay, that's just not natural the way that that looks just from surgery wise. And when we're talking about rear ends, we're talking about some shoulders and we're talking about some other stuff too. And you're like, okay. And so like, I'm glad that you're out there promoting that. So yeah, that they can see that like, yeah, the, you can do this naturally without, you know, doing all that stuff. So. Well, I think a lot of times, you know, magazines and, and what we see is a, a very deceiving. Um, and you know, you, you look and, and young people, especially you look at the cover of a magazine, whether that be male or female and you go, wow, I want to be like that. And in the magazine, when you're reading the articles, people are telling you, oh yes, this is what I ate. This is what I did. But you don't realize that I'm not saying all, but a lot of the people that are a lot of the athletes in those magazines, they will take performance enhancing substances just to get to that point. And so when somebody does it, you know, at home, they're like, wait a second, I did everything they said and I don't look that way. <laughs> and so that's a deceiving part. Now, you can do it. It, it. You have to be very disciplined and it takes a coach or somebody who knows to tell you how to do it and it can be done, but it's not as easy as, as one thinks either. Oh, 100%. I mean, and again, like I've said a million times, even if you do the stuff, you still got to put the work in. It still takes the hard work and the dedication. There's there's no drug, unfortunately. Like I said, I'd be the first person in line if it took away, you know, just having to do anything where you could just magically just, you know, like take a pill and then you wake up the next morning. And unfortunately, that is not the case because, you know, yeah. that is such a good point that you're saying. And we're seeing that all over the place, especially after COVID. I, I think that um, that there's a huge resurgence when it comes now to taking ownership yourself of your health. And I think we realize that one pill just can't fix everything. It can't cure everything. And you've got to put in the work as well. I mean, that, that was something that beforehand we always preached. I think after COVID, especially a lot of people were very disappointed with, Hey, we were told this, or we said, if you do this, you will not get something, you will be okay. And that wasn't necessarily the case. And people are realizing, oh, well, I have to take care of my immune system. I have to take certain vitamins or do certain exercise or eat certain foods to take care of my body. And then maybe that extra pill, that extra, whatever it is, will help in addition. But that one pill is not going to be the solution. I just love how they have that one commercial talking about like if you have if you're at risk for getting severe COVID or something like that, you know, take this thing. Something like that. And when they're listening to at risk factors, all they're saying are is if you're at if you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, they don't even list obesity, though, as one of the causes, though, as the things. And it's like. That's the number one cause then if you're like severely obese. So I, I, I've just found that funny how people aren't willing to admit that like being severely obese is probably the worst thing that you can have, not just even for COVID, but for just for other things in general, because everyone anything. doesn't want to offend anyone. So that's why I've always found fun. For anything, yeah. you know, and you are so right about that. It, it's fascinating. Just uh, I'm going to give you a little story. So I, I have the four kids. My, my second daughter spent 11 months traveling throughout Africa 
last year, female solo travel, you know, it was an amazing experience. And this was just post COVID. So in many of the countries, some were shut, some were open. The interesting thing about this is that after, as she was going through each country, she said, mom, only 25% of the population here has been vaccinated. The instances of COVID had been well, people got COVID, but the instances of deaths in Africa, if you look at it, is so, so small. And when she was talking to people, she said they would look at her and they would say, listen, no offense to COVID and COVID is a terrible thing, but we have real problems down here in Africa. We've got Ebola. We've got malaria. We've got things that will really kill I was going to say the immune system in, of an African person is probably a lot stronger than, than it is here. So Well, and, and so, and that's the thing, not to take away, but, you know, COVID, just like many of the terrible things that we have here, like you're saying, if you have diabetes, if you are overweight, you will minimize all the very negative side effects or the negative consequences of having almost anything that, that you will have. And um, that, that was really, really interesting just to go down there and for them to say, hey, you know, we respect it. However, we've got some big issues down here. So it's just one of the many things. Well, we're not going to get into too much of a COVID tangent, but I'll end it with, I mean, I was talking to a guest from Australia and good God, they were like in lockdown for like two years they couldn't even like leave their house and stuff. And that's just going to the opposite extreme of that where, and they were a competitor to Rose black. And so she was just talking about how yes. much that infected everyone where it's like two and a half years of barely being able to leave your house and just, so yeah. There's, my, yeah. I, you know, I really take my hats down to so many, I know quite a few competitors from Australia, from New Zealand, and they could not go to the gym. They could not. And so for them, to keep their bodies where they needed to be, to be able to find ways to do those workouts, to get in shape, to use what they had. Um, it, it took a lot of ingenuity. It took a lot of adaptation. And so many of them did it. And, you know, kudos and, and my hat off to, to all of them. There's such a, a huge passion and purpose community over here. My home away from home, Destination Dallas, which is, um, it's Michael Johansson is the owner. He owns the Better Bodies and the Gasp uh, brand. Mm -hmm. And what they did even back then during COVID, I mean, I think we were the last gym to close, the first one to open up. Um, when everybody else was closing, it was like, hey, just come. I think it was at the time when most people are charging $15, $20 to, to get into a gym. He was like, hey, $5, just, just come on in. Um, the work that he has done, you know, just just creating an environment for athletes. It, it is such a family and friends and people remember that afterwards and have they destination is actually almost like a spot, a Mecca for so many athletes to come to when they're here in the Allen in the Dallas area. And, you know, it's that whole motto of working hard and playing hard, being relentless, you know, taking things to the next level in terms of the whys and the purpose of the lifestyle. So it, it you know, there are those people out there that are really helping athletes in creating that environment. Absolutely. And I mean, Right now, you're in your journey of you haven't competed for a little bit, and you're not going to compete probably for a couple more years. How are you dealing with that aspect of being that you competed for so long, and now you're just sort of taking your break just to rest and recuperate and get get better? You know, it, it's like a little bit of a roller coaster. Um, I in 2019, and the thing is that 2025, that's the year I'm getting back on stage in 20, and you know we're already 2023, so it's not going to be that much longer. 2019, I was so fortunate. I'd been inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, 2017, I'd been a Miss Natural Olympia in physique. I had competed abroad, had three uh, world championship titles, had done over 30 shows. At the time, well, I am, at the time, I said, you know, I've done everything that I had wanted to do and even more within the sport. I love the sport. I still want to do it, but how can I help? And so I, I took a, a back, a step back in a way and started doing a lot of coaching. I judge, started promoting the Mr. Miss USA here in Allen, um, being able to do things and create, you know, have an impression, create a footprint on especially the net. And, and I've, I've competed NPC, I've competed um, 
in the naturals as well. And they are both amazing. I mean, everybody does. I just know that for what I do, I know where my place is. And that is, I will do very well within that natural community. But to me, it's out of respect for the athletes as well as for myself. I love to compete with everyone, whether it's the MPC or anywhere else. And I think that's that's very, very important. Now, yes, not having competed, I was very fortunate because 2020, well, COVID hit. So I didn't have to think about it too much. But now in this interim, it is tough sometimes because the gym that I go to is very heavy in terms of the competitors. And I'm constantly seeing, you know, it's off season, we're all getting much bigger. All of a sudden it's time to compete and there comes the leanness and there comes the shred. And, and it's hard sometimes mentally to be in it and yet not be a hundred percent, be a part of it, but not be doing it yourself. And your mind can play a lot of games with you as well. Oh, well, will I, can I do that again? You know, you're only as good as your last championship or your last competition. We say the person you want to beat is that person who was there on stage the last time. And so for me, I know that with a 2025, and the reason for 2025 is because I said, I don't have anything to prove to anyone but myself when I turn 60. And so that's what's coming up. We're, we're about two years and a little bit away from that. And it's going to come up soon. And that's where I want to test myself again. And I feel that that is important, even for others who follow me, who have watched, just because I have injuries. I've had certain surgeries. I'm getting older myself, but I believe that age is just a number in a way. And I believe that you can adapt. Is it hard? in the off now? Yes. Is it going to be harder to get back into it? Yes, because there's been a lot of muscle mass that has been lost. It's learning also how to cope with looking normal every day. When you are on stage, that those pictures, what you get, that's a very, very short period of time that you're going to look that way. Not even 24 hours. I'll put on seven pounds of water weight and other weight from the moment I step off that stage, the minute I start drinking water and everything else. But the last several years, well, I'm not training for competition. I'm not eating for competition. The tendency initially is to go overboard with everything and then totally get out of shape. It's like, wait, 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 wait. You have to find that balance and you have to find that level where you feel good looking at yourself in the mirror. You know, other people, they come up and they'll say, oh my gosh, you look so great. Um, if I could have a body like yours, those kinds of things. And I have realized that it is so rude not to acknowledge that instead of, you know, usually the answer would be, oh gosh, no, you know, you should have seen me here or no, I'm, I'm so this or that or the other. Well, by saying or doing that, you're actually insulting the person that is complimenting you and they don't know what's in your head and they don't know what you've been through. So those are things too, being able to accept the compliments, regardless of what shape you think you are in and be able to be I think a role model and an influence for, for others wherever they are in that journey. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I had a guest on last week and you won't be able to tell who it is because I mix up the episodes, but like, yeah, she said the same exact thing where, when I said like, wow, you look amazing. She's like, really? I don't think I look that great. Yeah. And it's like, just take the damn compliment for God's sake. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I've learned that th there's the, the wisdom of age yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and everything else. And, you know, I, I hear that so often and, I may think that, and you, of course, I think that to myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, my shoulders used to be so much more rounded and, and I had, you know, more volume in this, but that's only for that other competitor. That's for a very small, unique group of people who understand each other and understand where they're coming from for everybody else. Oh my goodness. It's, it's not that way. And, and if you say that they won't understand that. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> that with time. do you have a plan for like when you try to put on the size again or yeah. try to regain everything? Like, do you have a date in mind of when you're going to do it or what's the plan? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So usually, you know, if, if somebody is new to this and they want to start competing, they're, they're, you know, 
they're fresh, they're new, you take them from wherever they are, and you tell them, you know, depending on where you're at, you want anywhere between six months to a year of preparation just to get into that first time ever competition shape. And, and that's just that initial time, you know, and, and that is once you get on stage, that is your foundation. And from then, now you can say, okay, I need to beat that girl. I need to get bigger shoulders. I need to get more of a taper. My quads, you know, my flare needs to come out more. My glutes need to be tighter. All of that comes afterwards, but you don't know how your body's going to respond initially. Once you've been there and done that, and I have for 10 years. So for me, it's like, wait a second, this is what I looked like when I last competed. I don't want to step on stage other than looking at least like that. So there, there's a whole other, and I still, I work out, but I work out not for competition. I work out just to keep a regular size. I'm going to have to get in not six to months to a year out. I'll probably need at least a year and a half because there's going to be that period. So if we are, let's say if I'm going to, we're in 2023, 24, 25, if I'm going to compete and my birthday's in May, so I want to be that 60. I'll most likely be competing that summer of 2025. I need to start thinking literally January of 2024. That's when my off-season bulking prep for competition begins. So literally in about, you know, eight months, seven, eight months, that's when that side of it will begin. Um, it'll be easy to get it off. What's going to be hard in this case is getting it on. And it's not just the workouts, it's the food. I know right now I don't eat enough. I, um, I'll eat maybe three meals, a couple little things here and there. I am full with that. That is definitely not enough. So for me, it will be learning how to create those habits, again, of having those five, six meals and almost forcing yourself to have certain food. And when I say that, especially for a natural athlete, it's not about getting big and fat with the foods. It's about being very specific with the types of protein, the types of carbs, the types of fat, because for us, we never want to be more than about 14 to 20 for a female, I would say, pounds over what your stage weight is going to be. Um, for most other guys will be different, but you also have to think, especially for a female competitor, and depending on what age you are, as you start to lean out, those wrinkles start showing up because there's that loose skin. And it takes a while for the body to absorb that skin. It happens, it's no big deal, and it will go away. But if you are at the weight and the specifics you want to be the week of competition, you're like, oh my gosh, what happened? Everything is sagging. It takes that couple of weeks for that to sort of suck itself in and then everything be okay. So th those are also some of the tips and tricks, you know, with the age which a lot of the young competitors don't have to worry about initially. But yeah, there, there will be, and I'm not going to do it by myself. I know a lot of things and I know how my body works, but it will be about finding the right coach, the right trainer. Even though I train a lot of people, I need somebody who is outside my little bubble, who will put the workouts to get with my help, of course. And it's, it's always say it's a team effort between that athlete and their coach, but that coach is so, so important for the physicality, for the nutritional side, but even for that mental side, so important. Any of you out there who are thinking about competing and you say, oh, I can just look it up on, on YouTube or I can just get all the information, that's a great start, but you have to get a coach if you really wanna do it right. And especially for the posing side of it, you could do everything right. Your body could look absolutely incredible. Thing is, when you get on stage, if you can't show it off, if you can't present it, all of that hard work is for nothing because that's the difference between maybe fifth place and first place would be, even with a fantastic body, would be that posing and that stage presence. 
Absolutely. Well, and this is a question that I've asked a lot of the NPC guests that I've had on about just how much that sport has changed in the last, you know, like five years since I started this podcast. But how has the natural sport you think changed in the last, you know, or especially when when you plan on going back, especially from like 2019, because bodybuilding is always evolving and changing. What have been some of the biggest changes you've seen happen just in the natural sport? Oh my goodness. And I, and I think uh, a lot of that is really parallel because it, the, the sport is the sport. And regardless whether it is in the natural or for those who may take something to slightly enhance, we all want to get bigger, right? So that's the biggest thing. I mean, you look, I look at 10, 15, 20 years ago, both in NPC and in the natural federations, and the athletes now are so much bigger in both of them. Um, and, and that's where, you know, and it depends on the criteria of the judging. There have been years where the criteria is, okay, we want big, we want massive. There are other years where, no, the criteria is conditioned. And sometimes judges don't understand what, what conditioned mean. They think, oh, conditioned is big. Well, conditioned is tight and fit. And at a point where, you know, and you'll see so many that say, well, you know, you could have had two or three more weeks conditioning. And what that means, of course, you want those full muscle bellies, but you need to be able to see, depending on what category you're in, I want to see certain shredding, but full. I want to see certain striations. It's not about just having a fluffy kind of look. And I think in the past, within the naturals, there's been a tendency to say, oh, well, fluffy is what you get because you're not taking certain um, fat burners. That's bullshit. Yeah. I, you know, that one of the things I don't get very big, but I get shredded. And that is, on, you know, and it's interesting because I always used to tell myself my mindset, because when I first competed was NPC. And I always used to tell myself and some people say, oh, my gosh, but I trained for NPC and competed in INBA. Now that has changed now because I think the INBA has gotten to the, and that was way in the beginning because you were expected to be really cut, really shredded, obviously in, in the NPC. And I think there was that excuse sometimes in some of the naturals that, well, we're natural, so we just can't get that cut. Uh uh, if you train right, if you're eating the right things, you can definitely do it. It just takes longer because you don't with some of the fat burners. I see people in the gym that within I saw them one way four weeks ago. Now I see it was like, oh, my gosh, you have lost and you've gotten which I admire. That would take me twice as long or three times as long. And that's where the mindset comes in that you've got to do this. I had a client just recently say, yeah, what about spices? Because I'm 13 weeks out and I'm already starting to get sick of chicken. And I'm like, well, you know, that's yes, you can use those spices and you've got to find a way, but it's going to take a little bit longer. Now, you're asking Well, first of all, if my Scandinavian stomach, I'd lose 15 pounds in one night eating spice. So, you know, <laughs> that, 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 See, that, I that, hear that works you. that I hear way, you. but yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. No, exactly. Now, the other one are what's changed a lot are the divisions. When I first started, you had bikini and you had figure and you had bodybuilding. And since the, for women and for men, it was literally just bodybuilding. And what's changed is now trying to find different categories that fit different body types. So that's where now, you know, in the naturals, we'll have what you do in NPC as well. We'll have physique. We will have, um, uh, what do you call it again? Now there's wellness, which is a huge different one. And that's where I find it very interesting to see where wellness is going. Last year was the first year for the INBA to have wellness. Um, the NPC had done it the year before. And I was fortunate enough to go to the Olympia last year and watch wellness and Oh my goodness, those ladies were absolutely incredible because it's bikini from here up and it is pure bodybuilding from the waist down. Now, at first, you know, we were wondering in terms of judging for naturals, at, at first one thought, okay, it favors more that Brazilian, uh, Latin, maybe even Indian type body type where you have the wider hips 
and you have the, the slider build up on top, that's all fine and great, but that's not gonna work unless you really build those quads and you really build that booty. Um, it's not about you're just bigger on the bottom genetically, it's about making sure that that is pure muscle on the bottom and that that is as well, you are very, very fit on the top. So those are, and for the guys, you know, just having the classic physique, which is going back to a little bit more about the aesthetics and how beautiful, you know, the, the days of, oh my goodness, you know, Arnold, every, and, and of course there, there were certain things that they, they had, but not to the level and just how they presented themselves and, and the beauty there within. So those are really cool things that have happened, I think. Before they brought back Classic, how would the men even cope with just having just bodybuilding? Because to me, that's just like you're just going for one body type then where it's like you don't have – like because some guys are just built genetically differently where they might not be able to just pack on the absolute size. How did they deal with that? Exactly. You know, and that's a good point. And it's interesting because even before Classic, that's where board shorts or the act, the physique by itself came in. And that allowed for, you know, that that was just the upper body, the perfect abs, nice, beautiful shoulders, your GQ type of guy um, and who just did not have those legs at all, whether they forgot them at leg day or. They that would be me 100 percent. I wish I would have known that ahead of time. Yeah, that would have been me. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and sometimes you just don't. Um, and then it's, again, it's genetics. I had two really, really cool brothers as athletes of mine um, a couple of years ago. And both brothers, very different body types. One of them excelled specific, wonderful, big legs, great for body, huge back, great for bodybuilding. The other, perfect for classic physique, still had, had the whole package but had the aesthetics to go along um, with almost like more defined, more uh, graceful lines, I think. You know, what bodybuilding is just pure. And the same thing happens with women now, too, because you get your women who are just pure, pure bodybuilding. And then you have those who have that beautiful physique. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've done a podcast with Vicky Diaz ever. Not yet, but I think I've messaged her, so we'll see. We'll get her on. You you should. Now, Vicky Diaz, it's been a couple of years uh, since she's competed, but she was my idol when it came to physique. She became an IFBB pro, and yet she is tall and slender, but as slender as you would say for a physique competitor. But I would say, wow, if she can do that, I mean, extremely muscular, but very long and slender in her own way and i find that was to me the epitome of what physique should look like as opposed to the blockier um bodybuilding the problem now is especially in npc you see those girls coming down from bodybuilding to physique to figure and so everything is getting so much bigger and it makes it really really difficult for for certain athletes if they're not up to par and up to scratch. Well, speaking about the some of the OG bodybuilders, I have been in contact with her for a little bit now, and we finally scheduled a date. It's going to be in April. I'm going to have Corey Everson on, which I'm, <sighs> which I'm excited about. because You know, yeah. and, and she is just such a wonderful person. It's just so beautiful to see. And, and I would love, I can't wait to hear that podcast. And, you know, because you talk about changes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I mean, nowadays, she'd be bikini. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know she'd place too either. <laughs> and it's so, you know, that, that was another thing at Destination Dallas. We had a few months ago, it was the 40th anniversary of Better Bodies. And I don't know if you know the story behind Better Bodies, but it was Brian Moss who has uh, had the original uh, gym in New York. And this was back in the mid 80s. And, you know, and I, you have all the pictures and, you know, all this. That, that's where my, I'm still stuck in the 80s, I think, pretty much. But, his was the first gym that opened its doors to women and encouraged women to actually lift weights and bodybuild. And that was that whole time. And you look at those women that were very strong. They, they I was going to say, your look, you'd probably place in the Olympia back then in the 80s. For, yeah. probably, oh, my gosh. Yeah, back, back then I might have. <laughs> I just, you know, the funny thing is I never even – had heard or entertained, if somebody would have said bodybuilding, I'm like, body what? Yeah. Until I was 45. You know, that that was, 
something that wasn't even in my vocabulary until later on. And that's something I want to encourage people to. It's never too late. There's always, and for me, the reason why it was such a great sport is because I did have knee issues. And so I couldn't, I uh, anterior cruciate ligament, you know, damage and, and torn this, that, the other. Bodybuilding is a straight up and down, you know, it is very controlled. It is so there's a lot that you can do with it without having to move too far. It's not, and you don't have to be a huge power lifter either because it's about the aesthetics of what the body looks like from here out. So much of it has to do with illusion. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, in talking about injuries, you did go down to South America for your husband to get some stem cells done. And anytime I hear the word stem cells, there just because I was raised in the air where there was a lot of myths going around with stem cells and stuff like that, that, that you know, it just and South Park made an episode where they made fun of it, basically. And it's, you know, <laughs> so anytime because just because that's my generation where anytime I hear stem cells, I always think about that. But what what exactly, you know, I, I haven't really done my research on stem cells. So what is it and how did it, how oh did it help your goodness. husband and what's what's that all about? Ryan, cutting edge technology. And we had heard about and it's this specific company called BioAccelerator. And they do, although they have um, offices here in the U.S., they do a lot of their procedures is down in Medellin, Colombia, which is just an incredible city to begin with. I'll tell you a little bit about I've that. I've seen the show Narcos. I know all about Medellin. Well, that, that's the thing. Most people go yeah. down there and think of Narcos yeah. and nada que ver, yeah. I would say in Spanish. No, we even went to um, Comuna 13 where a lot of the Narcos and um, everything was. It is such a touristed area now. People absolutely so welcoming, so safe. It was great. But with BioAccelerator... Fascinating. Two years ago, a good friend of ours who is, I don't even I mean, he works with the NFL players. He works with um, all sorts of high caliber, high level athletes, getting them well. Um, he found out, talked to these guys from BioAccelerator, uh, sent a lot of the players down there. So this is not just the stem cell therapy. It's a dime a dozen here in the U.S. now. We hear about it all the time. The problem is you hear, oh, yes, I went and it didn't quite take or I have to go every three months or six months or something like that. It's not supposed to be that way. You're supposed to get whether it is infusion of stem cells, uh, certain specific injections in certain areas where you need it. And that should pretty much if you are not going to injure yourself again, that should be the end of it. The problem is with the FDA and the way things are here, we are not allowed to provide the amount of stem cells, you know, there are millions and millions, Greg got like millions of them injected into him and that's not allowed over here. So it was incredible. It was a week, you go down there, they put you up into, in a hotel, lots of exams beforehand, you know, making sure that everything's okay. Um, Nutrition, very, very important. Even three months before going down there, you, you're put on similar to a bodybuilder's diet, anti-inflammatory diet, you know, no coffee for a certain amount of time, no EFAs, you know, fish oils just because of certain things with stem cells. Um, very, very specific going down there. He ended up with infusion for the whole body. Part of that within 10 days, he said, you know, it's really weird. I know this is impossible. But I feel as though I woke up 25 points ahead with my IQ, you know, and what it was is just focus, you know, and they, it takes, then he had some, I think in his knee, a little bit, something in his back or as a chiropractor an acup who always has to use, he's getting a little bit of that bunion that you get in your thumb. So he had some there as well. Now. It takes, these are itty bitty baby stem cells that come from umbilical cord and it takes them a good three months before you're supposed to see any results. We're only about two months into it right now. However, the mental focus within about 10 days and that hasn't gone, he said, hmm, this is really interesting. Now we'll see what happens over the next you know, month in terms of how those stem cells um, progress. But this, uh, there are a lot of very, very famous athletes, celebrities who have gone there. Um, so, so many stories of great things going on uh, with stem cell. And it was, like I said, a whole week because there's a time for infusion. There's a time for very specific injections. They do physical therapy with you after. And then even afterwards, 
the hardest part. He was told, you can't work out for three months. And he's like, what do you mean I can't work out for three months? Well, this is the reason. What the stem cells are doing, these little baby stem cells are trying to find the inflammation. And when we work out, we break down our muscles in order and that's what makes them grow. So let's say you're doing your arms. Oh, I didn't get any stem cells in my arms, they're fine, but now they're sore. And so the baby stem cells are gonna make their way to your arm where you don't really need them because that's a created inflammation. That's not the inflammation that you have in your body. So anyway, it, it, was, it was great, it was fascinating. We are gonna be encouraging you know, people who may be interested in that. We have the, the guys from BioAccelerator are coming actually to Dallas in a couple of weeks. They're working with some of the NFL players and the combine and all of that. And they'll probably come and and do some talks and everything else. So we we highly recommend. Fantastic. That is great. Yeah, I'll leave a link for all that stuff down below. And I mean, if you're talking about one of the top ten people in history that I would interview, re- regardless of you know time something, we talking about Medina. I mean, Pablo Escobar would probably be one of the top ten ones. But again, I have certain scenarios. I have certain stipulations that would have to be. First of all, it would have to. It, it could never be in person. I would not risk oh, that. Wow. I would have to be blacked out. My voice would have to be muted. You could not have a signal of where I'm at. But yeah, I would ask him so much. I mean, you're talking when you're talking about a guy who has to spend tens of thousands of dollars a year just on rubber bands for his money, just to get his money to put on his money. I mean, that's just it was really cool. We actually saw the last house that he lived okay. in and the we, we saw one. We saw a couple of his different houses yeah. in different places, but the last one that he lived in and where he tried to escape yeah. and where he was shot on his yeah. roof when they finally got him. And, you know, th- there's that whole romantic notion. It's not, yeah. He was a bad yes. guy. And um, it's a shame when you see some, like, narcos and things like that. It just, yeah, you know, romanticizes the bad boy, whatever. But so many people were killed. And Thousands, I, I did, uh, yeah. a free walking tour, which is a fantastic walking tour in Medellin. Mm-hmm. And our guide was absolutely amazing. And he was like, okay. Voldemort and I'm, we're not going to speak his name yeah. and you know he was of course referring mm-hmm. to and giving us a whole history and everything that had happened and even you know it's fascinating why mm-hmm. that culture yeah. even started and where it started from and a need of the people initially just like what happens with you know certain dictators certain drug lords yeah. things like that and it comes out of a need and a disconnect between a government yeah. and a people and, you know, like he was even saying, you know, there are two different Colombias yeah. and there's a Colombia that he said, I don't even know myself yeah. because it's the yeah. people that needed so many yeah. things, but weren't being given that by yeah. the government. Just like the mafia in the U.S. basically or in, the, in, or in Italy too. Yeah, it's, it just comes a lot from corruption and people just need something. So then that all arises for that. But yeah, I mean, I just love the fact how they're still even there's farmers today. They're still finding millions of dollars that were buried in their land that they're just digging up and that it was this money that he buried and then they forgot where it was at. So it's, yeah. it's like modern day pirates. You can yeah. go and- <laughs> Well, funny thing though. So the, another, but literally the school, I can almost see it from my house right now. It's a, it's a, it's called Bloomington Lutheran. Okay. Like when I was younger, there was, I think there was a robbery. It must've happened like 10 years before and they buried money underneath the school playground. Oh, really? Like it was like a hundred thousand dollars or something like that. And when I was young, the kids were just playing like sandbox, like in the thing. And they just started digging a little bit. And, like, it was only, like, a foot or two, like, below the ground. Then they, they found something. And it was all the money still there. Really? Well, whatever happened with that? I mean, So they connected that... it to the robbery. And then they gave the kids, I think they gave the kids, like, a certain percentage of it as a reward just for finding it. I remember, like, wow. one kid said, like, yeah, I got Timberwolves season tickets for life or something like that as, like, part of the thing or something. But, yeah. So I just, I just remember hearing that. And it was funny because, like, you would never picture, like, the neighborhood that I live in, like, as a neighborhood that would, like, have bank robbers that would, like, go and... So yeah, that was, that's just my little two cents on that that's too as well. That's crazy. But what an interesting story. <laughs> I, I honestly, one of these days, I'm just going to start an old podcast where I just talk about weird things that have happened in my life. Cause I have had a weird life for, for a guy that hasn't traveled outside the U S I've had some weird things happening, nothing bad or anything like that, but just like, just stuff like that where you're just like, okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of crazy when you really, well, think Ryan, about you it, brought but... the rest of the world to you, you know, in, in all your podcasts and all the guests that you have. Um, so, which is really, so, really neat. So on Saturday, I'm talking to a guest from Hawaii and that's going to be my last one of the week, but that will now complete. Cause I talked to a girl from Alaska two days ago. I have now done all 50 States. Then when I'm done with that. Whoa. Yeah. Well, well now, now you need to, 
Well, I hey, I've done I've done all the countries that have English as their first language. I've done that. That's why that's why pre and I've done like I've done France. I've done I have an Italian coming on soon, but I'm trying to get all the countries in Europe too. And then I've done a few South American countries. Like I've had Haldo Lopez, who I talked to her from from Honduras, and then I did one from Mexico, and then I have one from uh, El Salvador. I'm gonna try to do all the countries in the world, but obviously, like for some of the guests, I'm trying to get like North Korea is probably not gonna be a not going to be up there, but, um, yeah, so I'm just going to try. So yeah, I, like I said, I, I have learned more from this than I would have from, from a lot of things, which is why I was always that kid in school too, where it's like, why are we learning all this stuff? And I could just like go out and experience it myself and learn it, especially being the history lover that I was, I was like, why don't, why don't I just go to Thermopylae and, you know, Greece and then just like see all that stuff. But so yeah, that that'll was, come, that'll come, that will come. So yeah. if you don't have anybody from Argentina yet, I'll put you in touch with Mati and Pauli. They, who are the presidents of latin america as long as they pronounce their name and i don't have to <laughs> no and and they they speak pretty good english okay. so um that that'll be awesome which is awesome because like you speak so fluent spanish like i've seen interviews that you've done on youtube where you're in full spanish i was like wait that's monica but then i forgot that like you're from you you grew up around there and yes, i did and grow up there i was born in new york but i was oh my gosh seven and and that's that was a great thing that my parents did my mom after i was born because we lived here in the states she would talk to me in spanish at home because I went to school in English. And then when we moved to Argentina, I was seven years old. She totally switched and she'd only speak in English to us at home because I was going to school in, in Spanish. So I I'm very fortunate that way. And Oh my gosh, if you can learn some languages, I wish my dad's German. And I went, I said, dad, why did you not speak to us in German the way mom did in Spanish? Cause I mean, I took it in school, but so I, I speak fluent German because I took it all throughout high school and all throughout college and I actually used it. Yeah. The bad thing about that though is that you in the US you can never use it. Like it's it's never been applicable ever. So And when you don't practice a language, it just yeah. starts Well, every once in a while, like I'll I still like I'm not gonna lie, like a week ago, I just I still sometimes do like those CDs every once in a while where yeah. I like I watch a YouTube video where I just I'll just refresh it and stuff, but Actually, I'm going to lie. There was one scenario at my current job that I was at that I've been working at for like seven months. There was – they do a lot of business in Europe, and there was a speaker that was speaking German, and I did translate for like five minutes what they were saying, and then I translated back to them. So I hope that I somewhat prove them a little bit more valuable employee than for doing that. But again, they don't do that much business, I don't think, in Germany. But it was it was cool to be able to actually use it for once and like – no, no. That's fantastic. That's really, really good. And so you, you speak Spanish. So I did, I did play a joke on some of the people that, cause I, there's a lot of people that speak Spanish at the place that I work at and they, and they speak Spanish sometimes not in front of me. So I can't understand what you're saying. So I looked up how to say, um, you realize I understand the, everything that you've said, right. In Spanish. So then one time when they were talking, I just turned around. And I said that to him and the, and the shock on their faces and the jaw that dropped. And, and I just told him, I said, no, I'm just kidding. I just looked up how to say that basically just to, just to fool. Oh, you, guys, you shouldn't, but... you shouldn't have said you were kidding. But no, I, here's the thing. Like I'm friends with them too. Me. So that like, I didn't want to, but here's the thing. Like I didn't want them to then start speaking to me in Spanish and be like, yeah, I'm going to pretend that I understand everything you're saying then. And yeah, that's the problem. So, that's happened to me so many yeah. times when I've been in situations and people are with, whether it's traveling or even around here. Yeah. So, and people will speak and, they're saying, yeah, because she, this, that, the other. And I'll turn around and, and I'll just engage in the conversation and say something. They're like, yeah. oh, my gosh. Like, well, you know, you've got to be careful. Look, mm -hmm. Looks are deceiving. Yeah, I, the, one of the best videos that was I saw a guy who did it in China. It was a white guy who did it in China who then was a start, it starting to speak Chinese in front of people. And just, yeah, that's, I, that should be just a whole category of videos right there. But I mean, I like that. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, <laughs> like we talked about, you have the aren't you have the IMBA Classic coming up in uh, – down yes, in the Allen area. The Mr. Miss USA. So very excited about that. That's going to be July 1st here in Allen. Last year, we had competitors even coming from Australia. Um, as you know, most of the local uh, natural shows are smaller than, let's say, an, I, I am an NPC show. Mm -hmm. But for a local show, this was actually pretty big. It was fantastic. We want to grow it this year. Um, and it is a Mr. It's a, um, uh, a natural Olympia qualifier. In the natural Olympia, we get over 60 countries with all their teams coming from all over the world to Las Vegas. It's usually the second weekend in November. It's about a four-day event because there's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, amateurs, pros. Uh, award ceremonies, inductions. And so this here in Dallas, and it is the only one sort of in the mid country. There's certain shows that are in the West Coast, certain in the East Coast, but Dallas is the only one sort of in this, this middle Southern area. And I'm super, super excited. Um, it's always great. Our, we have some fantastic sponsors and people who help us out. And I 
can't wait. And if you are a competitor, it's a wonderful show for beginners mm -hmm. as well because it's a pro and amateur. So it's a, a pro qualifier. And we do something that I love, which the INBA does, which many federations don't. We do an angels. We do a transformation. So for people, and when I judged a show in Florida last year, usually transformation, you think of women. This is not the case that there were four guys, four guys were doing the transformation. And transformation isn't just necessarily, of course, there's the physical element because we're judging you on that. but one of them, it was um, how he had come out of certain addictions and drug. Another one was a veteran who had had suicidal, um, that, that, that he had al almost committed suicide, but then, you know, how he was basically brought back and saved. And so his whole transformation and journey that way. Others might be purely, you know, for years where we're the sick kid or the fat kid or whatever. I love this category because it is a platform, then you get to tell your story. You get to show a big poster of your before and your after is not necessarily an after, you can still be on your journey. So we get people who do transformation one year and they're still on that journey. And then they come the next year and they compete in the bodybuilding, in the figure, in the bikini and whatever it is they're doing, or sometimes uh, they'll do both. We have a tatted and ink division. So for those who are inked, male and female, they can come up. And you know what? We actually do kids. And of course, the kids isn't necessarily bodybuilding, but it's kids fitness. But it gives them, especially in uh, that arena, giving them a platform and saying, hey, do it the natural way, do it the healthy way. And of course, when you're little, you may not have, but as you get a little bit older, that will come. Well, I've heard about some of those kids that are myostatin deficient that do that. So that might be one of those kids that need to be entering those things. Cause that's the one thing. I mean, you want to talk about genetically blessed. Good God. Yes, exactly. I mean, and that's where as a kid and what a great way just to, you know, and you have some kids who may not, they, they see their peers doing all sorts of other sports or, you know, the girls that go out and do dance and what a great way to get in front of a stage and, you know, you may not be the great football player. You may not be the great baseball player or basketball player at that age, because of course muscles haven't developed yet or strength. I remember my son was a gymnast, you know, or tried to be a gymnast for a while and he ended up being a soccer player, he had great strength on them. But you know, most kids from your torso up, you're very weak until you hit puberty. And so this is another great way to, without necessarily lifting a bunch of weights, but using your genetics and using other plyometrics and, and other kind of sport to get you on a bodybuilding stage. So what is the angel category? Angels are wings. Okay. And they are beautiful. So what angel is, think of Rio de Janeiro, Carnival, Mardi Gras, there's sass, there is personality, there's... It's sort of bikini on steroids <laughs> in a way, but it's the creation. They will come with their wings that they create and bring and get that chance to do that T-walk, to do those quarter turns. It's funny because when you get a bunch of angels on stage, you know, with the wingspan, they need all this room. But it is a beautiful and, and wonderful category to, to do. And that's something that is a bit. Another one which we do both for men and women is a sports model. So with sports model, you're, the the guys are sort of wearing that not the board shorts which are long, but more of and not a speedo either, but sort of those those sporty kind of GQ oxygen whatever magazine. Mm -hmm. And the girls will have that very the tiny sports bra with the booty shorts. And it's a great way even for somebody almost transforming or transitioning into figure physique, but who maybe don't feel quite or others who have that great sports body, because that's exactly what it is. Think of fitness magazine. Think of something like that, but very um, personable as well. Very realistic, very uh, somebody that may not want to diet down to have that physique figure or bikini but looks amazing doing that sport model yeah. so there you have it what are some ways that you think that the natural sport can really do to 
help itself grow more? Because unfortunately, like it doesn't get the coverage that the NPC does and that the other federations do. What are some things that you think it can do to sort of help spread its message more? I, I think you're so right about that. Part of it, part of it is also there are many different federations even within the naturals. And I personally would love to see a coming together of a lot of those natural federations. Um, and, and many of them do. Hey, for example, with the INBA, if you have a pro card in another natural federation, as long as you're in good standing with that federation, you can come into the INBA and you can compete as a pro in ours. I think there needs to be a little bit, some of the federations now, what we're seeing, um, and we get that a lot too, well, pro payouts. A lot of times the federations are much smaller, so they'll guarantee something, but it's very hard for them to give. And a lot of athletes, that's how you reward an athlete. A, a pro athlete is with a payout. But unless there are sponsorships, unless there, because I mean, when I promote a show, I'm not making any money at the show. I'm relying on sponsors and others who are wonderful to do that. But you know, our amateurs, of course, they love getting a sword. They love getting a backpack. They love getting X amount, uh, you know, a, a new suit as a prize. But what they would love a lot more is getting the cash that says, you're a professional. We are rewarding you for that. And sometimes, unfortunately, that is not the case. I think that would bring in a lot more competitors. The second thing is, too, I think judging criteria. And, you know, you, everybody needs to be on the same level when it comes to how they're judging, not judge. I, I hear, you know, you hear things out there. Oh, yes. Well, the winners is because they put more on social media or platforms. That's ridiculous. It's what you see. It's what you're judging. Um, so I, I think there, there needs to be and, and a big coming together as well and letting other athletes know that this is here that this exists mm -hmm. and that this is a platform for them yeah absolutely uh, it, it's you know it's funny because it's big in other countries mm -hmm. and there are certain european countries are certain and so we need to bring that back over here now as you're saying People, you know, if you're not in the sport, you don't watch it. You don't. It's not something that interests you. And, as you know, when you go, when you look at the NPC, it's like, whoa, those are the big guys. You almost sometimes you look at bodybuilders from the freak perspective, the, the you're you're in awe of them in one way and you respect and you say, wow, that's amazing. Not for me, but that's amazing. Yeah. Um but I wouldn't want to look like that every day, walking down the beach all the time. And so it becomes a little bit more of a show in that way. I would love to be able to show that uh, the healthy side of bodybuilding. I mean, it's got to be a, a lot of people will say bodybuilding is not a healthy sport. And they're right. It can be a healthy sport, mm -hmm. but it has become a very unhealthy sport because wanting to be bigger, wanting to do more, wanting to have more. I had a, a friend of mine, a very close friend of mine recently pass away from a bit of that. I, and it wasn't from that, but that's what started it. A bit of that complex of, I want more. I, you know, you get a taste of what things could look like. And then you get so caught up with that, that you lose sight of the reality around you and, and those who were part of your group who no longer can relate to you. And then it becomes a very, very small community that does understand you. But if something happens to you, you get injured or you have surgery or you can't be in those circles or compete anymore, your whole life is shattered and devastated. And, and that, you know, we need to get away from that. You know, bodybuilding is a great, to me, it's a wonderful, serious hobby, mm -hmm. but nothing more, nothing less. Absolutely. Well, I do got to ask who, do you have any idea who came up with the idea of giving out swords for gifts? Because that's one of the greatest gifts, ever. like seriously, like I, 
if they were to replace that with Super Bowl trophies, like if they were to replace the Super Bowl trophy with swords, I'd be all for that. Like if I were to get a sword as a gift, you realize how much more harder I would work at something for like anything in life. They're like, here's a really nice sword. So first of all, how do you know, like where they get the swords from? And do you have any idea like how it came to be? Cause I'm always been fascinated by that ever since I've started learning. I know, that I, know no, I don't know how it came to be, but I remember earlier on, Oh my gosh, the first sword that I ever got was like, Oh my gosh. And you know, it depends where, but the swords I've got about three or four different and they're different kinds of swords and they're so neat. And you know, some will be more the Viking sword or there's more the, the um, like the McLeod, you know, British, this, that, yeah, they're all very, very different in, in how they make them and what they do. I, some of them come from abroad. Some of them are purchased over here. It is fascinating to me. And, and I love the sword. Now it's a little difficult if you're going abroad or somebody who's coming here and then has to take a sword back on an airplane, that can be a little difficult, you know, just to pack. But I have a lot of athletes who in our federation, we don't give swords to amateurs, but that is what our pros are, um, our first place pros will get that special sword. And it is something I get people coming in, competitors saying, man, I want a sword next year. I'm going to work my butt off so that I can become, you know, a pro and compete as a pro and and get that sword. I love it. So you're not going to believe this because I tell people this and they don't believe it, but there's a sword at a museum in Norway that technically it belongs to my family. It's, it's a thousand year old sword from, really? and what it is, is, um, my great one of the relatives there just died so now it's literally passed to my dad so my dad technically owns it so we've never even been to norway and stuff so and then when my dad passes it goes to one of us three and then we already voted kind of that it's going to be me because i'm the one that's the most interested in that type of stuff but we like if we want to we can take the sword out of the museum if we want and have it be in the really? family yeah it's like it was part of the thing Do you know where it is is it in oslo in the because there is that like there's a viking museum they i mean oslo has a couple of incredible museums i wonder if i've I, ever seen i think it's museum. i think it's trom i think it's tromzo okay yeah i've been to tromzo too yeah. but i don't know if we were in a museum there or not wow that's so, incredible yeah it's it's really weird when well, you, you have to go visit that. it I, like i've said that's my that's if there's any place i'm ever gonna go travel it's gonna go there because well first of all we have a our family there owns a hotel so we got free lodging then so at least there's that but yeah that's good so. and, and is the is the hotel in tromso as well no it's like it's hours away like it's in a small village i think they just gave it to like some historical society when they really just get but it's like yeah, it's like a small village of like 500 people that lives on a fjord basically so oh you know, ryan you gotta go you know some crazy stuff happens happens in those small towns my dad's from a small town of about 180 you never know what goes on there but, <laughs> <laughs> but no yeah exactly that is, exactly oh that is my awesome. gosh but yeah so again you guys it's always a delight to have monica on and share. we oh. always talk we talk about everything when monica comes on which is great because you know it's uh, there are times when i just get bored of asking you know the same type of questions so it's always nice to have have on guests where we can talk about more but i do gotta ask before we wrap things up so did you always have this broadcaster voice or was it something that you learned? Because literally the moment that you started talking, the first time I had you on, I was like, okay, yeah, she definitely worked in media before this because there's, there's just that voice that whenever someone speaks, you can tell that like they have had broadcast experience. That's sweet. Um, actually, yes. You know, it's, it's so interesting. I'll, I'll tell you this story. When I was little, I always wanted to be a vet growing up. Problem was I'm extremely allergic to cats. I'm quite allergic to other animals. And this is in Argentina, but it was still, okay, you know, I sort of want to be a vet and I don't know what I'll be other than that. I was 16 when we moved here to the United States to Dallas. And the year that I moved or right after was the Falkland Island War in 1981 in Argentina. I felt a huge connection. I mean, I'd been there between the ages of seven and 16, and th those are your growing years and huge, huge connection with uh, Argentina. And I had my best friend who was the same age as I was, wrote me a letter. And that was in the days when we didn't have phones and yep. email and internet or anything. So she wrote me a letter and these letters would take, you know, a good month to, to go back and forth sometimes. But it was such a beautiful, almost like a poem. These were 15, 16 year old boys that were going from Argentina that were going to the Falkland Islands to try to defend the island, fighting against the British who had invaded. And, you know, th there's a whole history surrounding it. And at the time, there was a lot of news from the British, there was a lot of news from the US, but there wasn't really that 
third side of the coin perspective. And so I said, you know what, here goes nothing. I'm going to trend, uh, I translated the letter into English. I mailed it to, and you don't probably even know who that is, but those who are a little bit older, Ted Koppel, who used to, was the one who first started Nightline. Oh, yeah, Nightline yeah, yeah. Was a big news, you know, show at night. So we sent that to Ted Koppel. I did send it to Ted Koppel. I said, okay, done. You know, I've, I've done what I could, not thinking anything. Three days later, it was six o'clock in the evening. We were, I remember because it was right before final exams or so. This was in March. Um, no, it was March or April Well, when, or closer to me. Anyway, um, I get a call and my mother answers the phone and says, yes, Mr. Koppel. And I was like, what? They called my parents to get permission to fly in a crew from Chicago to have me read that letter. They got in touch with my friend because we called ourselves the Mochila de la Paz, the backpack of peace. They contacted her. They had the two of us on Nightline um, live. And then after that, I got probably, oh my gosh, several dozen letters from soldiers, from young people, from old people. Um, oh, you did. And they wanted to make it into a political thing that I was for Argentina, which wasn't the case at all. I'm not anti US, I'm not anti, I just wanted to show the other side and what was happening over there. And after that, that's what made me think wow, there are more than two sides to every story. I want to influence people. I want to make an impact. It was right there and then that I decided I want to become a broadcast journalist and I want to get into news and I'd love to do documentaries. So I went to UT Austin, got my degree in broadcast journalism. Luckily, since I knew, and I had actually got to meet Ted Koppel later on again, a few years later and Sam Donaldson and thank them so much and, you know, whatever. But from there, I came back to Dallas and my first job was in radio, in Spanish language radio and on the radio. So that's where a little bit of the voice comes from. And I was part of the first 35 years ago, we just uh, celebrated the anniversary of Univision in Dallas, their first newscast. Now, what I used to do initially, people before there was a newscast in Dallas, those who were Spanish speakers who didn't speak any English would turn their TV on, watch the news, they would lower the volume, turn the radio up, and I would simultaneously translate what they were watching on TV. And then I transitioned into television and worked in television. I was reporter, then I was an anchor, and I was a news director for a little bit before we totally left everything in 92 and went backpacking around the world. So in, in a nutshell, yes, I did have a little bit of... of um, Do you know but, if there's any footage of you reading those letters in 1981 or whatever? You know what? <laughs> I, I know, I know. And there we had, they send, we had, I think there, I think I might have, it's a VHS tape from, yeah. you know, which now wouldn't even, and I do have some pictures and I think there is still some footage okay. and my friend, I think has it even in Argentina too. So, oh, I looked very yeah. different back then. Oh yeah, because I, I was gonna say that I, I know better as an adult than I did as a kid. <laughs> I, I know there's a website that like saves major broadcasts from like up to like I think it's like 60 years ago. They have like a lot of really? them saved, so I can look it up. Yeah, if you oh, remember, yeah. if you remember the date or something like that, I can probably look it up and find it. Yeah, uh, it was like the 25th of May. Okay, uh, like yeah. 20, around around the because it was right around the Argentine um, 25 de Mayo is like in not the actual independence is July, but 25 de Mayo is when the Argentines fought the British and kicked them out with boiling water and some other things. So it's around that week of the 20th. And this was in 1982, I want to say. It would have been, yeah, 1982. All right. I'll so, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. If you can. And it would have been Monica Hurst, H-I-R-S-T. Yep. All right. Sounds um, good. Well, nightline. That's will, so yeah. cool if you found something like I, that. I will go and definitely look that up. And again, you guys, I mean, we cannot thank Monica enough for coming back on. It's thank just you. an absolute delight. And I can't wait to have you on again in a year. And you know, hey, we'll even have you on in 2025 when you're about to compete in the show. So we'll be able to see that then. But again, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. I always love being here. And um we will see you soon. Thank Absolutely. you so much for having me. Absolutely. All right, everyone. This is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone.